and we've got a question from Gad Music, and I just want to say thank you, Gad, for being being such a great supporter of Voice Masters live stream. Um, and the question is: Are there different types of dis are the different types of distortion you mentioned limited to a certain range? Have you have you noticed any kind of range limitations, pitch limitations for these? Um, that's a really good fry screen effect. So you're going to be able to give a fry screen. Then you it's difficult to say really. I'm, um, I wouldn't say that Ariepiglottic, um, any of the superglottic um, distortions. I would say they're probably about in the same range, from my experience. Okay, so right now you you haven't done any zoning on on pitch limitations not massively um i mean just what i've heard in songs essentially like with you know performance and stuff um and i would say yeah the fry scream is very much high frequency effect but I, the, the super glottic distortion i would say um is just kind of like standard vocal range really yeah I've noticed um, doing doing the effects and singing with the effects as well, at least for the guys, sometimes mm -hmm. you take your distortion up, um, and you know, let's just be honest, some people are really masters at this, and we can't, ha you know, unless you've been really, this is the thing you've been focusing on for years and years, um, you might not be able to do <laughs> the exact same thing right away. But I noticed right around about, uh, a C, C sharp for a tenor, but we're talking about a C5. Right after there, the distortion, uh, if, if, we're keeping it, if we're keeping it high volume level, it just tends to automatically trigger the arytenoid cartilages to going <laughs> in there a little bit more, unless, unless you continue to the light, lighten the sound. But um, let, me, let me pop in Zurin. Zurin's going to um, also talk this. Can I, add, can I ask you, Zurin, what your personal experience is on that? higher frequency distortion up there hello well at least for me um, what I see is that when we pass and I'm gonna mention that as well when we pass that exactly that pitch you mentioned and um, what happens is that we're doing a whole other style artistic choice um, which I'll mention and talk about um, what I personally call yell screaming um, so it's a whole different thing and yeah as soon as we go into the different voice types and so on, we have limitations um, and that's where it is. So if you lower your pitch or your larynx a lot, let's say you're turning yourself into a bass a lot, then you will not get up there, of course. Um, mm. And likewise for other things. So it's, I would say for the particular full distortion, I have not heard anyone go past, uh, what was it, A, a6, I think it was. That was quite quite impressive, uh, uh, like a, um, a power metal type of thing. And that was quite impressive. I don't remember the band name right now, but that was really cool. It was a student who showed me, and I was like, wow, okay. And I heard my daughter do it um, not that <laughs> long ago as well. Yes, uh, she is five, and she did um, a, a, A6 as well. That was so intense. I was like, what? Why, wow. why would you? Um, so, so yes, that is definitely a possibility. Um, if we're relaxed enough, then we can at least. <laughs> um, yeah. But yeah, fly scream is a fun one because either you hear whistle, as you mentioned, all the way up, high, high, high. But the mm -hmm. funny thing is, I added in, added fry into a um, very, very low setup um, where you suddenly, where I looked at a frequency analyzer and saw myself drop two pitches more just by adding fry because mm. it's mechanism zero, right? So yeah, I just had to test that as well at a point to see what it would do. But yeah, it's, it's a fun one for sure. <laughs> cool. Cool, thanks for jumping in, Zoran. I appreciate no it. And it's so fun um, to have just this nice open discussion community on this. Uh, we've got another discussion uh, question here. Is it the same technique when we want, when we just want to add a quick ornamentation or a quick effect for example in a pop song are they I mean we'd have to hear the song exactly what, what you meant Diego um, to be really specific for you 
But um, I guess the question is, is it the same distortion activation that they're using in a pop song? It is, yeah. And um, I think it would probably be a, a higher up distortion because it false folds, um, as I was talking about a little bit earlier, when you when you introduce the false folds, it becomes quite a heavy distortion. Um, hang, on, hang on one second, Nicole, because maybe somebody noticed but somebody's mic was on we we're getting some nice jazz music in the background so i couldn't hear you very well but yeah um, i love jazz but go ahead nicole um yeah i was just saying that when you introduce the false folds um you start to get um like a it's it's a more erratic vibration it's not like a light distortion if you know what i mean um whereas like kind of like if you're around like the cart the, the cartilages um, then you'd get a lighter distortion, but it, it's the same. Um, it is the same effect as like sort of the aryepiglottic, um, epiglottic distortion. Um, but obviously, to to quickly pop it in, um, I think it would take. If you're if you're trying to do it as a beginner, it's unlikely that it will just come really naturally. So I think you'd have to take it quite slowly, um, and then obviously once you've learnt it, 100%, you could put it in a little bit in a pop song here and there. Um, but it would, yeah, it, it takes a bit of training, definitely. Cool, thank you for that, Nicole, and thank you for the question. But you kind of answered this as we went along in, in, the, in, the, in your presentation, but I think it's good to come back to. Um, mm. For me, it has to do with what, what do we actually, when somebody says distortion, what do they mean, right? And this question is, is Fry a type of distortion too? So. How would you answer that question? Did you freeze up on me again? <laughs> She's, I think, I'm sorry to poke fun at the, oh, there you are. I was going to make fun of you. It just looked like you were thinking. Um, yeah, awesome. Um, yeah, so I was saying that this is debated a lot in the literature, um, in research, um, because yes, it, there is like audible, like popping, um, with, vocal fry and vocal fry is essentially it's like a long adduction period and then it kind of just releases and that's where you get that like popping sound but it is still periodic whereas i would classify distortion as being in uh, like chaotic essentially like chaotic vibrations that don't have any set um period yeah I, I also think it, it really depends on how you're trying to define it, right? If we just, if we say a distortion is something that distorts the sound, then every effect is a distortion, right? Mm -hmm. But if we're saying, when we're trying to get a little bit more specific about, okay, what is, are we going to, what we're going to call distortion? Are we going to call, you know, distortion the sound of the false vocal folds or the aeropiglottic folds and the false vocal folds? You know, then, then it gets much more specific. So if we're looking at Fry, like you said, if, if Fry itself, if we're, not, if we're not comparing it like that, then if we just say any sound that distorts the vocal sound, then Fry is a distortion. It's, a, it's distorting the pure ah, uh, ah, uh, it's just a distorted sound. But, but yeah, it, it's, it's tough because people don't really agree on Fry and Fry scream and how that's done. Um, if anybody's got some great research on ex on the, the exact um, activity of the vocal folds during fry and creaking, then send it to me. Um, what Nicole's mentioned is, you know, is, is great. I know we're going to have Zuren's going to talk to us a few weeks down the road about that as well. And uh, we're just, it's a learning process. So I think we should just, we need to stay really open minded with, with the effects. You know, as we as we go on, because it is young in the research, and we're just gonna we're just gonna figure it out more and more, and researchers are gonna get more clarity into it. But um, the purpose of talking about it openly today is just say, yeah, okay, what do you mean by fry? And this was Carol, so maybe we should ask Carol. Carol Donato, are you still are you still with us, Carol? Let me see if I can find you. If you if she's got her mic turned off, so. It's okay. You don't have to join in and say anything. But if you want to, you could. But Zurin wants to add something to that. He's jumping up and down. <laughs> what, can, what can you add to this, this question? So what I would say is Fry is not periodic at all. Because when you look at the vocal folds, they're jumping here, there. They're, doing, they're not 
doing pure vibration as we would see. The reason for that is you're trying to sing two pitches that's next to each other. But connect, connecting that sound into one, that's the reason for it. When I look, when we saw the research we did with Natalie Heinrich from Gypsy Lab, we saw that the, voc the false vocal folds can be the same as what you would see on the true folds, and the setup should be the same, um, both area epiglottic and and without. So, so yeah, it's it depends on on whom is doing it, of course. But in general, the fry is not periodic at all. It is just jumping from it's it's a freezing. You're doing a glottal stop, and then it's doing small vibrations here and there. It's not doing pure vibrations whatsoever. That would be quite a that would be the first time I've ever seen it. And the research part, you said, um, Ingo Tietze did a really nice paper on vocal fry. Um, his, he did the first paper on vocal fry quite some time ago now, actually. Um, it should be quite easy to find even for free nowadays. I was, I was just going to bring up Ingo, actually, because Ingo was actually the person who said to me that the, the fry as a register is the, the reason you hear the audible popping is because the frequency is so low. So if there's a set frequency, then obviously that is a form of harmonic voice, surely. Yeah, but they're, they're put together. You're trying to do two pitches as one. If, if you try to do M and N after each other, then it will happen on its own. If you hold on to these two sounds together, that's why it's, it's disrupted and not a pure sound. So. So when you say that there's two, are you saying that because the vocal folds are so slack, there's like two pitches, essentially, is that what you mean? Yes, you're trying to sing two pitches at the same time, and that's why it's not a, a pure vibration anymore. Okay, could you could you forward me the paper that you read that in? I'd be really interested to read no, that. No, that's that's what I found out. <laughs> right, okay. Yeah, not not that, but, but yes, in general, when we look at dry, it, it doesn't do a pure vibration, it is jumping. It's frozen, and then you do small vibrations here and there. Okay. It, it all comes, I mean, I think that's super fascinating. It was just, there you have it again, is like, what are, what are we, what are we uh, calling Fry and which activity is it, you know, which register? Um, mm. it's, it's super fascinating. But I, so as far as I understand, and, and you all can jump in and help me with this, but but when we're doing uh, fry or creaking in the fry register, we just we don't have the vocal folds are not doing anything smooth and normal, yes. right? It's very chaotic. It's very irregular, and it actually differs from person to person. Basically, because depending on where they're planning that pitch, of course, you know, yeah. faster vibrations, faster vocal fold movement. So so let's let's. Um, I think the cause we've got we've got the low you're talking I think we're talking here more about the low uh, vocal fry right and if we if we I think it'd be fun if anybody wants to work on just taking this as and we got this is great because we're getting a lot of discussion here but let's let's see if anybody would like to work is there anybody wants to work on their fry scream so we got another question from I'm just going down the list from Tony. Thanks for your question, Tony. Often in rough vocal effects, we can hear and see on a spectrogram subharmonics, which indicate a certain periodicity of, of course, there might still be random interharmonic noise. And even in your examples, we can hear clear intervals if we listen closely. Have you found any examples of ventricular or arytenoid effects where that is not the case? So, so you mean when it's like completely chaotic? Is that what you? Is that what that means? That's a good question. Let me see if we can ask Tony if he can clarify that. Can you clarify that a little bit, Tony, for us? Yes, I can try. So, um, when we have distortion like a, we can usually hear an interval there, for example. Yeah. A. Can you hear the octave? And so, of course, there might be a bit of extra noise, but I would call that periodic. Well, there's both in the sound, right? Because you've got the, the A periodic and then you've got the, the periodic as well. But the majority, I mean, you can you can sing under the distortion or you could have um, a periodic distortion. Yes, there might be like, you might be able to pick out the odd sort of harmonic 
activity going on there, but it's predominantly in harmonic. Mm -hmm. in that and, uh, in, when people um, try to do, for example, Kagura throat singing, where mm. they want actually that undertone to mm. be perceived, they are relying on it to be periodic, right? So, yeah, so I'm not acting. saying that in every rock distortion we do hear these intervals clearly. I guess in <laughs> most cool music, people don't care about subharmonics. Um, <laughs> but when I do, yeah, I don't hear noise. I hear two clear fundamentals, right? Yeah, it kind of depends because I mean, when you're talking about like throat singing, throat singing yeah. is slightly different because throat singing is when the the false folds are vibrating periodically as well. So then you get two um tones essentially you this get two is what tones. i was doing though at a higher range right well you mean what that was throat singing is that what you mean it wasn't throat singing authentically but this was ventricular yeah. folds coming together at half of the frequency right so i, I just mean yeah. that i i think it's a bit too easy to say that every distortion technique is aperiodic i think it can vary and i think it can be controlled to do to be done in a periodic way for most of these, except for, of course, like the, the total atonal white noise fry, of course. Yeah, totally. And I mean, yeah, because it's, it's possible to vibrate the, the false folds periodically and get that that like throat singing effect. So it all depends on how, how you're going with it. But obviously, when you're explaining to people like the basic effects, then it will confuse people by being like, oh, this is this. But, you know, they're also going to have a bit of this and a bit of this. Do you know what I mean? So it's Probably, easy. Yeah. Yeah. Do you see what I mean? I do. I do confuse people a lot. But of course, there will <laughs> be, yeah. But of course, there will be variations. Like, but that it's like that in any singing activity. You know, there's always going to be kind of variations on effects. Well, thanks, Tony. That that's a great demonstration. Nice demonstration, and and thanks for bringing that up. Yeah, I I have to just say, you know, we we are all um, going to continue learning about this more and more, and unfortunately. There's never time to cover all the details, um, <clears throat> but what I would like to do for all of you rockers out there is I would like, and I'm, this is going to happen, down the road we're going to have some really uh, more advanced level informational live streams and courses where we can get into the nitty nitty gritty, um, but we can't, we can't do that you know, without losing 95% of the audience, right? <laughs> and that's not an insult. It's just simply, there's a lot of layers of learning. And there's a lot of things Zuran knows that I, have, I don't know, and Aliki knows that I don't know. And, you know, we might be able to learn from each other. So we're going to, that's the mission of, of this live stream is just to continue to share knowledge so we all can, can grow together. A quick question I think we could take as well. Um, did the ginger example also include mic effects? Probably. I'm during saying no. I'm I'm sh I I don't know. I think pretty much. I'm just gonna go out on a limb here, but this is, I can't guarantee this. But any produced track is okay. It says mic effects, right? Mic effects are not post-production effects. So. What, why are you shaking your head no, Zirin? Let me see. You know, get you off of mute, yes. try it. So yes. why, were you, why are you um, saying no? Mike, are you saying no, they're not the mic effects? They're yeah, it's, there's no cupping, effects. there's no cuffing or cupping the mic, so there's none of this making the larynx lower um, or seem lower. <laughs> It's basically a yell growl that's going on. So she's having the falsetto region in action and a very low pitch at the same time to make this type of a thing. So it's like a um, -ah type of a thing. So it's -ah! so that it gets louder. Yeah. yeah. But most most of the, I mean, every every uh, produ produced album that I know about in in heavy metal and death metal. They're they're layering these f effects to increase the spectrum. Oh, but that was a live that was a live performance, so there's no such thing. I don't hope so. It's not a there, there's of course bands doing it nowadays, but it's not like that common in metal at all, especially not in growly um, sounds whatsoever. Not on you not put on the album, yes, to yeah. <clears throat> or whatever to connect yeah. them, of course. But 
to make a brighter and a lower pitch at the same time. But however, Ginger is doing a yell scream in that song a lot of the time. Yeah. Um, so we're just looking at the video clip that Nicole shared. It's from a music album. Yeah, the truth is we're not we're not going to really know exactly what they added, if anything. But uh, the sound, the sound, I think that was a nice example of adding. You've got the low and the high harmonics in there that are making it yes. sound bigger and wider. All right, well, now I am recording. <laughs> so, I my wanted, tea yes, enjoy, <laughs> enjoy your hot tea. Um, yeah, thank you, first of all, for, for coming on Voice Masters live stream. I appreciate your time. No, thank you for having me. And I'm ex I think uh, it's great that that you started doing research on effects. We need more people out there doing research on effects, and uh, I'm, I look forward to watching that grow. So, yeah, do you have any plans to continue? Are you con considering doing the PhD, or are you? Yeah, I'm definitely considering the PhD, because unfortunately, at, at master's level, obviously, you have to have existing research to compare, and there just isn't enough. So, um, I think, yeah, I'd really like to get into research properly and get, you know, all, all of the, um, do lots of experiments and stuff like that. So I think, yeah, definitely going down the PhD research route. Um, it's just no money. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it, people don't realize how much research actually costs, you know, if, if you're affiliated with a university that happens to have a clinic and all the equipment, then they can help you out. But then you also have to have, if you want to have a meaningful representative uh, research, you have to have a certain number of participants, right? And then with vocal effects, that in itself is can be a challenge. Totally, especially because because the training isn't, it, it, there isn't a, a lots out there. People that are doing the effects, you know, even if they've been doing them for a long time, they're not necessarily doing what they think they're doing, you know, um, mm -hmm. so it can be quite difficult really finding participants. Um, yeah, it's a tricky one, but it needs it. So I'm, I'm willing to do it, you know? Yeah, I think it's great. I think, I mean, I can only encourage you and i um, happy to help out, you know, we'll, uh, there's, you know, there's plenty of singers and there's other, other young, singer researchers that are that are interested in this so i think um we can let's try and get a good community of, of people together that have that are very skilled at this and then um then we can have some more then this a study would have more interesting results i mean it came up in the live stream you know we talked about that ingo Tietze did a paper on fry you know fry register what is fry but i mean how many participants did did he have you know, I've I've spoken with him because of several times we live geographically not too far away, but that's usually one of the main issues is finding enough singers that can actually mm -hmm. maybe reproduce consistently the coordination, so you mm -hmm. can actually see what's going on. And I think it's interesting also to compare people that that have been doing it for a while, people that are new at it, and that could be give some interesting insights as well you know it's showing okay what what does a person what is a person doing that's just learned this like mm -hmm. a week or two ago at what stage are they and compare that with somebody that's been actually doing this for for years and years and years could be very fascinating anyway lots lots to learn so totally. i think it's fun and it was it was kind of a it was definitely more of a well you got your internet kicked out and we cut out and you were gone for a bit but uh, we had some other people in there that that work a lot with effects and that was really cool i thought that you just said hey aliki why don't you jump in and try something that was very very mm -hmm. cool of you and um and so we just we had a lot of people we had one five five people that work with us regularly having like some interesting viewpoints and mm -hmm. I thought it was fun. I thought it was fun. I think we should all get on a call with a couple more people and, and uh, sometime just uh, hash it out. <laughs> totally. And I, I think I always love getting the questions as well because I, I always get ideas for things to look into, you know, that I right. haven't thought 
of like the range thing i was like do you know what i've never even thought of that like i just i mean i have to a certain extent but not in detail so like that was really interesting um yeah, yeah just, i love when you're around others it just inspires you to learn more doesn't it so but you yeah. always feel like you don't know anything <laughs> <laughs> well it's it's yeah i i understand you know but yeah. but um just just that it's just another example in the research if you want to do really what do you research and this is you know i've spoken with ingo and other researchers about this i mean the amount of time it takes to view imagery you know this high speed imagery you know if you, you can do three minutes is is how many photos it's like three hundred thousand images or something like that with this high speed imagery so it takes quite a bit of time and so the the focus of of the research can be very narrow and then you get these questions like okay well range are there any range limitations to this what happens in a female voice in a male voice and these pitches what's different what's similar I mean, it just literally takes years to to yeah. look into all of these things so great that you're on it and uh i w i just want to encourage you if you need any encouragement go for it if whatever you're passionate about and all the singers and coaches out there whatever you're passionate about keep keep learning you know keep that growth mindset we can all learn from each other um let's take some questions so i'm to nicole are you working in conjunction with an ent or voice clinic on the research at this time who is who is doing the scoping um so the person who did the scoping was declan costello um who is based in london um so he yeah he did the scoping and then the other one um which was the the video of the screen that that one um it was an inhale for ice cream example um that was at my for, for uni i was there and uh they had an ent come in i think her name was lucy i can't remember her second name um but she was doing scopes as part of our class so everyone got an opportunity to be scoped and they said to me that they wanted me to do it so that i could we could see what it what distortion looked like um so yeah, so um, um, interestingly, it's actually from that scope that I learned how to do it because I couldn't get the positioning right. And then obviously when I had the camera there, I was like, okay, is that the false files? And they were like, yeah. And then, I, you know, that's actually how I learned is having the scope in <laughs> um, at uni. But um, but yeah, so at the moment it was just Declan Costello mainly and then um, he scoped a leaky um, and that's how I got that, that those videos. Um, I'd love to work with more, but like, like we've already discussed, it's the expense because I don't have any funding. So um, it's the expense and getting ideas together and stuff. Right. Yeah. And that's that's uh, we talked about that. Right. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I I'm a I absolutely just support the fact that okay, you're very open ab ab about the fact that you have just had in this one the one um, study you did, it just involved two people, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah, if we, if you get to the PhD level and you want to get published in somewhere, you're going to have to have many more participants, right? Yeah. And that's, those become the hurdles. But at the same time, I think it's valuable to, to share whatever you find at every stage that, that just leads to more questions and, and can lead to, to people actually getting funding for research projects and more collaboration. So I've got another question here. Thanks so much for this, first of all, from Simone. Question, which is the best type of distortion to use with belt? It purely, I mean, not, not for ice cream, I would say. <laughs> um, but um, it's obviously there's some form of superglottic distortion. Um, but it would sound so it would sound like belt but it wouldn't actually be pure belt because obviously for belt you need like a long adduction period of the vocal folds which isn't advisable when it comes to doing distortion because you'll over compress but if you it's it's kind of like um uh Zorem was saying um about the yell scream that like Ay! like it sounds like you're belting but you're not you're not like the vocal folds themselves aren't belting it's just that you get more power when you introduce the false folds um or the irf folds yeah i think 
that, that's an interesting topic because we'll have to talk about that a little bit. But for so my first response would be um, just to, to say exactly what you said that you know the creaking the fry, fry ice cream that's a very low volume effect. Mm -hmm. So to have you know belting where you have a, a, a higher compression or a longer closed quotient of the vocal folds that's necessary. Um, it's going to be higher volume. So that immediately is going to eliminate creaking fry from from the effect moving part repertoire, mm -hmm. right? And and then you it depends really, Simone, on the on what you're looking for, what sound you're looking for, because you can have different activities inside there, moving around and distorting the sound, but um, really I th I think for most people. It, they tend to, unless they're being very nerdy and saying, I want a belt with uh, false vocal fold, ventricular fold activity, that's going to give you a specific sound. But that doesn't mean that's the only sound that you need or you have, you can access. Most effects are, are a combination of various things. So I, I would also say it really depends on the sound you want and which, which ends up working best for you. You know, some people might get the arytenoid cartilages moving and it feels great and they're happy with the sound. Other people might be feeling much better with uh, the, the, you know, even a uvula tongue interaction. And then you've got the, the, the false vocal folds and the aeropiglottic arip folds that we're, we're kind of in the same opinion. Don't believe we can completely separate those, but um, it's really the sound that you're going for. And it looks like to me, um, Nicole, when you, when just based on your demonstration, and also the way you're describing distortion and 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 decompressing the vocal folds, that cr that creates a, a very specific sound, you know. But most of the time, I mean, if I'm doing a, a let's say a belt, let's see if I can do one like on a G, hey, a belt sound, and I keep that sound, hey. We can add different different activities to that. You know what? What's and I'm not really. I'm not sure. I feel. Hey! 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 There's a lot of different ways to go with it, but I'm not necessarily trying to decompress the vocal folds i'm curious is if just when you get that activation going with the motion if it kind of happens automatically yeah that that's yeah it's a good point um yeah because i think if you if you try and open the vocal folds you're going to end up with a breathy sound so um yeah i think you're completely right you go go for what feels natural and instinctively um well if you're doing it correctly then there will be um less adduction i don't think it's when you're first starting i try and get students to like do it more airy and then when they get more competent then introduce a bit more and a bit more um but yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't focus too much on trying to decompress the vocal folds for that for that reason yeah it's it's interesting uh, we also had a, a singer that volunteer for coaching and and you you picked up on that but there was still a lot of holding this tightness on the inside right and and the other one just had a very low larynx position mm -hmm. so you mentioned that don't relax or i think well, aliki was coaching him on that a little bit saying when you decompress don't lower the larynx right mm -hmm. And sometimes that happens frequently with singers, even not using effects. They just, they, they, they lower the larynx to, to get softer sometimes, or it's, it's really interesting. So if you have the, if you lower the larynx and it goes immediately to, to that breathy quality, because you completely changed basically the vibratory pattern of the vocal folds, then you're also going to lose the the whole the whole internal setting that helps you maintain that effect. Yeah. 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 We, I think it's helpful to to know the sound you're going for, both the effect style and but also it helps a lot for um, for the singer to know what 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 are they doing without the effect. 
Mm. You know, like we had, um, I think, another volunteer. She was, I mean, I'd love to hear her sing that live. She was like an E6, and she was she was belting that out. That was super loud. <laughs> but if if she's going to go for a fry scream up there, it's just, it's just going to hurt. Like she was mentioning, it didn't feel comfortable because there was so much pressure. Yeah. It's, that might be an interesting question. So <clears throat> this one isn't quite phrased like a question, but there was the discussion about fry scream, fry, vocal fry, register. What, what does it mean when they say vocal fry is a register in mm -hmm. scientific literature? So the way I've always been explained it by Ingo Tise um, is that vocal fry is a register that comes in under 70 hertz. And the reason why it's popping is because the frequency is so low, you can't hear an audible pitch anymore. That's the way I've always been explained it. So I would say vocal fry as a register is essentially our lowest vocal register. Fry as an effect seems to be confused with like creak and um and and fry scream i suppose and they are they're different because they're they're in a higher register they're not in that lowest register that's how i think of it but i know there was some disagreement about that <laughs> oh yeah I'm not, I'm not sure there was really disagreement it's just um it's just you you have we have to all get on board on on the words we're using and what they mean um, to everybody. I think as, as we went on, it just seemed like, yeah, people are agreeing more and more about fry. So the fry register is really the uh, the low end of the voice. Mm. And that's what you've, that's how you understand it as well. Mm. And then you mentioned cre creaking is that taking that irregular, irregular vibratory pattern with uh, Go, go, chasing waterfalls, you know, and the Britney Spears and Kardashian and the, it's very, it's very in. Is it in, in, in England? Because here, a lot of people are, yeah, it's really nice to see you. They're, they talk with that creaking on all the time. Yeah, it's not not so much here unless they watch a lot of like the Kardashians. <laughs> I notice <laughs> it the most when I'm, when I'm watching TV, when you get like, um, those stereotypical women from like LA, and they're like, "Yeah, <laughs> that's what I always think of when yeah. I hear like people speaking with fry." But I don't really hear people in in real life. I don't see people do it in England. Okay, I, I don't. I'm not really a big fan, but it people do it here all the time. It's like, oh. "Yeah, I'm good. I'm good. How are you? Yeah." It's just yeah. so. When I first moved here, moved back to the states, I said three years ago, I was kind of in shock. I'm just going, "Everybody's." creaking and using fry and so let's so for our discussion let's say the fry for now fry register is the low part of the voice uh, and when you take this this um sound uh, up in pitch you can you can learn to sustain it on on all the these different pitches but keep it a low volume and then the fry scream you mentioned that you like to do your fry scream on the inhalation, right? Yeah. And that's easier for me to do as well. Um, I think it has to do, because I've done a lot of high volume singing, so my voice is used to really tight vocal fold closure for high notes, high volume singing, and you need quite a bit of relaxation Mm. For, the, for the fry scream it needs you need to have you know it can't be squeezed it'll just if you squeeze too much it doesn't happen it's like mm -hmm. this combination of the right amount of narrowing the right amount of relaxation because if I go ah, let's go backwards ah, it's different than ah, that's going yeah. forward so I'm getting it closer together and um, but when we're using the fry screen, I, I just like to point out that it's low volume. You, and you use, do you have an external mic? N uh, no, not attached. I've just got my laptop mic on. So if if you let's see what it just sounds like f to give a demonstration. Do you do your like inhale fry scream? Okay. Yeah. 
It yeah, sounds great. Yeah. I think it sounds great. How is it to sing with that? Though? Yeah, wow! It, is it harder to follow a uh, melody line, or have you gotten to the point where you can just follow the melody line like that? I don't really use it these days. Um, when I was in college, I used to use it all the time because I was like 16 and thought I was really cool. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I used to use it all the time then, and I never had any qualms with it. Like I've, I've never, I never felt tired from it. But, but it's very much an effect that I've put on like individual like phrases. It's not something that I would use consistently over a song, um, purely because I just don't think it's. I just don't. I think you'd probably because you'd have to take. It would interfere with your breathing. I think too much. Yeah. I think it cause issues if you were to sing like a whole song like it but then that being said i know that there's um there are bands where the front person um does inhale for ice creams i'm trying to remember the name of them now off the top of my head but um but yeah there are there are things that do it but i'm not yeah, i'm just not curious i'm just curious about that because I mean, I can do the inhale fry screen maybe on a note, but move, I, I'm not. I, it works better to for me to have the forward flow if I want to actually follow any kind of a melody line. And I think that's it has to do with you know just you're gonna run out of air and the tightness sucking it. You can definitely change the pitches, <clears throat> but um, I don't know. I'm, I was just curious what your experience was with it. So you use mostly as just a one note scream. Yeah, I don't, I wouldn't use it for long. So like I would use it for like the odd word or phrase that I really wanted it to be like, really like gnarly. <laughs> but yeah. otherwise I would just use superglottic distortion. That's my favorable one. Question on on supra supraglottic distortion. When you're when you're talking about supraglottic distortion, do you mean everything that that distorts the sound above the vocal folds? And so arytenoids, uh, false vocal folds, aryepiglottic folds, all the way up through the vocal track, or you are you mainly saying ventricular folds, aryepiglottic folds when you when you talk about that? No, I'm I'm just talking broadly about anything above the vocal folds, anything that's not for ice cream, essentially. Okay. <clears throat> cool. Yeah. Well, this has been a lot of fun, and it was it was a great session. A lot of a lot of fun questions and um, a lot of questions happening in the live coachings. Um, is there anything you'd like to leave the? the audience with any points uh, on them or i would just say um don't be afraid of vocal distortion because i think a lot of people are worried about doing it in case they hurt their voice and i think it's quite difficult really to 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 really hurt your voice doing distortion as long as you're careful and you're not doing it for too long and you're just doing like small practices um i would say just have fun with it and and see see how you get on but listen to your body and if you feel like you're, it's hurting or you're, you're feeling fatigued stop straight away but other than that I would say just give it a try it's good fun when you get it <laughs> yeah I can second that it is a lot of fun and it but it does take practice you know it takes practice if you if you want to use it regularly it's a lot easier just to put it into a, a little spot on a song right than to sing complete phrases uh, or or real death metal uh, uh, songs, entire songs, and be able to do it, you know, an entire concert set for an hour and a half to three hours. That's that's a whole different level of ability. But it's yeah. fun to, uh, everybody would like to put a little growl, a little, little distortion in here and there. And a lot of pop singers do it all the time, right? Exactly, yeah. You mentioned uh, Beyonce has a, uses it here and there. I mean, she's not known for to be the distortion queen, but... She uses it. Gospel singers use it all the time. You've oh, got yeah. who Christina else? Aguilera. Yeah, Christina Aguilera. What about um, today? One of the singers mentioned Ed Sheeran. Yeah. There's so Capaldi. many people. Sorry. Louis Capaldi. Yeah, hasn't hasn't he become super popular for that unique sound? Mm. It's kind of got like this 
It's kind of like Josh Groban decided to become a rock star, you know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Got this big, really big, deep voice, and then uh, just going for adding that rock distortion effect in there, and and it stills placed in in the pop genre. You know, that's so fascinating. Yeah, yeah, for sure, it's really fun. Well, thanks for your time. It's been fun talking with you and uh, wish you all the best. Thank you and have a lovely Christmas and New Year. Thank you too, Nicole. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye.